And go. And go. And All right, everybody. Happy <laughs> Tuesday. This is the Bunderdome. We are live. We actually have both of us here today, myself and Mark Pellegrini. How are you doing today, Mark? Doing good. And we have for tonight our co-hosts, the SWC brothers, the Royal Loops. We have Thomas and Patriol. Pa- I can never say it. Patriarchal. Patriarchal. A- P- <laughs> Patriarchal. Happy. Happy. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And today what we're going to be talking about, this should be a fun topic. We were actually kind of going ahead of ourselves in the back room talking about it. Way too ahead of ourselves. Way too ahead of ourselves. (laughs) We're going to be talking about the simplicity of storytelling. And hopefully we can have some tips and tricks that a lot of um, potential comic book creators or comic strip writers and creators may learn something from. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Common America Volume 5 ended last week we are still waiting on a couple of surveys but for people who might have backed it i am going to give you some kudos this is actually a record number of surveys completed out of 3400 something people we actually are just waiting on about 300 of them which is way way better than it was last time where we were waiting for about 800 um within a week's time so it seems like creating like an infographic or something and putting that in the update really helped it really drew a lot of attention and you know people started filling them out but if you haven't you need to do that because you won't get a book if you haven't filled it out so if you're in here and you're one of the backers and you haven't done it yet you're going to want to do that right now we're waiting for the funding to clear as we normally do according to the the statement that kickstarter sent my way we're about 10 days out i don't know if that means 10 business days or 10 days total but it's going to happen here very soon. All the books and everything have arrived. And so what we're doing right now is we're finishing the quality control process. But as of this morning, I touched base and the books, I think, have all been accounted for. So that's the, that's the most important part. Some of the other things like prints, posters, things like that, as part of quality control, you might have a few damages in there, but it typically doesn't interrupt any of the flow of fulfillment. So we're good to go. The sooner you get your survey to us finished, the sooner we can ship something to you. So I will probably put an update out tomorrow, again, reminding people. And then hopefully by next week at this time, I'm going to have another update saying, hey, fulfillment's going to begin in about two days. I'll also be sending information regarding how to download your PDF and also how to download the ember file uh, for the statue. A lot of you might not even need that file because you might not be interested in 3D printing or anything like that. I would still say, go ahead and save the file so that if one day you do want to print it or one day you do get a 3D printer, then it's yours. You can do it. And these suckers are big. They're about like nine inches tall from um, head to base. So that is something you definitely don't want to miss out on. Okay, so real quick, The topic for today is going to be the the art of simple storytelling. And the reason I wanted these guys on is because they have their own book to promote, which is called literally Issue 2. Issue 1 you can actually find on Amazon. And if you look at the detail description for this video, you can actually find the link to their campaign and their book on Amazon. Again, it's just called literally. Um, What we want to talk about is how You don't need the most overly detailed art in order to tell a story. And I don't care if it's a sequential comic book that you buy in the physical format or a web comic that you might be reading for free or behind a paywall online. There are some things that we have noticed in terms of creators that we enjoy that I think can help everyone out. So the thumbnail that we chose for this evening specifically is, at least in the opinion of Mark and myself, we consider it the best free webcomic that you can read online. And that's not to disparage some of the other ones that we do read, but this one I think bears um, special attention to. And that is the comic strip put out by the Flork or Flork of Cows, which is how he's most commonly known. The link to his, um, his strip is actually in the description too. And I think it's called www that sockcomic.com. But um, I think that if you look at it and you read one or two strips, you'll see what we're talking about. A real quick shout out to the man as well, because I know he's convalescing. 
people who found out on Twitter or through Facebook know that yeah, he got the unmentionable disease that's been going around. And I think that he had a little bit of a scare there for a while. But from what I've heard from him directly, he's doing much better. And uh, he's home convalescing. And so we wish him the best. And um, I hope he recovers soon because we actually have a kind of a team up thing that we're going to be doing here in early summer. But besides that, we want to make sure that he's all healthy and rested. So There's anyway, been a few team ups, in fact, is not there? Yes. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have our friends over at Merriweather Comics. Mm. They're they're more complicated in terms of their art style is concerned. But I think one of the things that we're going to point out is that I feel that even if the art were pared down and made more simple, I don't think it would detract per se from the storytelling itself. But going to the floor, this <laughs> for people listening in chat who've never read this comic, there's no color typically other than I think red or like one spot color. But the whole comic is done in MS Paint and it involves sock puppets. So he takes his mouse and he draws these, um, I don't know how else to describe them except cute, but they're kind of this shape, this just like sock shape with two eyes, um, kind of an indentation for a mouth and two stringy arms. Yeah, it's kind of like a curve. He just draws like a curve and then another curve down the back and it's a sock. Kind of like yeah, a and it, it almost looks like a schmoo or like almost yeah. like a crude moomin or something. It, kind um, of, it reminds me also of uh, uh, what, Smiling Friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just this, like this curving, almost like Nessie's head poking out of the water kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Really simple. Yeah, extremely simple. And then I think he even does his typing in MS Paint too. But all they do is they just interact with each other per panel. And I remember seeing it for the first time and thinking like, okay, there's like a visual appeal to them because they do, I mean, for lack of a better word, they look cute. Like when you see them, they're so, they're, they're slightly, they're slightly more complex than a smiley face, but not really anything more than that. But whenever he's going through these strips, I mean, they're just hysterical because of the way that they're arranged and the humor that goes with them. And so I know a lot of times whenever we're talking to uh, comic book readers, which I think are my our primary audience, a lot of them are so focused on, oh my gosh, like I, I love this comic. Oh, what do you like about it? Is it storytelling? Well, I don't know about that, but it's like the complexity of the art. Like, man, you, you see, like it's so detailed and how it's rendered and stuff like that. The and detail. so a lot of them, well, a it's lot always of creators, about the detail. A lot of creators, they want to, when they're telling their own story, they feel like in order to tell it correctly, they need that level of detail to accomplish that. And I think that there are times when that's needed because you want to create the environment in a way where the read it takes the reader's breath away, where they think, whoa, like, look at all this foliage. I can't believe it. Like, this is really something to marvel at. Yeah, a, a mood or, a, or a, a, a theme or a tone or something like that can really be evoked by a specific style of art. And usually the better the art is, the better it can be at evoking that kind of tone or that mood. Yeah, but in the case of just your normal sequential storytelling, and again, that doesn't necessarily have to be just web comics because it seems like that's all that we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. I'm even talking about comic comics. That does not necessarily have to be in play. You can tell a story very well using just like the, the crudeness of it. And it's almost like, if you at that there's a point too where if that if the simplicity of your storytelling is in conjunction and marriage with the simplicity of your art i even think that upping the quality of your art can actually detract from the story itself mm -hmm. so for example if we just take a flork strip and i think if he were to start doing things like putting gray tones in it like shading it i think it would be almost detracting yeah it would ruin it Yes, absolutely. There are times, though, where I think he does it to great effect. Like he did this one recently where he just showed this um, this fork and he would use like forced perspective to show that its hand was like way in the distance. And in the second panel, he would show it like basically he was punching at the panel. And that's when he would go in and render like cracks and like glass in the panel to show like, oh, crap, he's like punching through the screen. Um <laughs> And, but he does that so sparingly that when he, whenever he does it, it's a surprise. Like it's like, oh man, like shit's about to go down because it's actually to... unique. 
the yeah, point he's about to break through. Joke. That's like something that's that's really like a something a perspective of a writer. It's like it's, that's something you expect to see in a writer's head. Yeah, you don't really see artists doing something that uh, creative. You see a writer, somebody who focuses on the actual writing aspect of making a it's comic like comes artist. up with that kind of idea. Yes, no <laughs> piddling artist comes Art. up with ideas Ew. that cool. <laughs> I think there are Hear times... that, artists? You're on borrowed time. <laughs> yeah, <Suck it laughs> artists. You're on short notice. <laughs> I think it's it's a rare occasion where there are artists who are completely cognizant of how the medium works. Because, mm -hmm. and then, again, this is just me talking from very anecdotal experience. But typically, whenever I'm given a script, Mark is the one who comes up with, "Okay, you have to understand that we're working in the medium of comics. So let's say we have an elevator scene. There's a reason why the panels are arranged." completely vertically because i want that sense of vertical motion the horizontal motion is going to get kind of confusing as we're going down in the elevator because that's not subconsciously what the reader is looking forward to but there have been times and i think we've told this story before where we've encountered professional artists who have no clue because they were just so used to just following the directions in the script that that storytelling is not intuitive to, to them for example we've told this classic story of how you always save your surprises for page turns mm -hmm. because let's say you're doing a horror story well you don't want your surprise to be on the odd numbered page because then you you give it away you want it on the even number and i know like mark was working as an editor for one guy and the guy was like wait what like what i, I want to put another page into the book and mark was like well you can't put just one page you have to put two well why do you have to do that well because you're going to ruin the page turn surprise and he was like what like i've never heard of that like that's so crazy <laughs> actually something that uh, i was working with i'm i'm working with somebody on a comic right now and uh you know that was one of the things i want to make sure that's actually it's not just something for a surprise it's something you want to do every uh page turn yeah every page turn if you can like uh make the reader sort of take them off guard in any way at all or yeah, you want to spark new. their interest and compel them to want to turn that page or a new uh location like if it changes locations on the page turn it sort of psychologically is primed to the reader if you're planning to specifically in make comic. a book though if it's yeah, yeah if in it's a comics, physical in comic, comic book yeah, yeah if you're going to do a, a comic at all you have to be prepared for that because at least one thinking things, about it, yeah. We're, we're making the comic. Uh, we intend to put it on Webtoon, but at the same time, it's like, well, we might want to print this, so we have to factor that in. We have to con make a, that a consideration. Yeah, so now you're thinking about the different delivery methods and how that factors into how people read your story, how people are, are going to experience your story and and uh, what they, you know, how the story will look to them as they read. In a way, digital is a little easier with that because every page is a page turn with that. But you want to still, you always want to say to yourself, well, what if I put this book out physically? How would it look? How would it read? And you want to be thinking about that. And, um, and in a way, yeah, that's um, with like, it doesn't matter if the art's complex or simple, as long as you're thinking about how that works the the art can be as simple as possible there's a lot of the stuff we were talking about um before the stream started like um like I've, i i had this book about making comics it, and it's not the scott and that's not any of the scott mcleod one it was um uh it was like a bunch of different artists we're talking about like here the uh, panels with this and do this and it was like uh, uh mike mcnola and and um uh, Bill Sankiewicz and that yeah, kind of Bill thing. Sankiewicz. And uh, they were talking specifically, like one thing I saw in uh, particular was um, like, it was some Marvel comic. It was, I think like it was Daredevil. And he was like, you know, jumping out of a, a thing. He was like, you know, going somewhere. But the background was just pure white. It was, it made sort of the drama of the scene be more stark. That was the idea of it anyways. And it shows that you don't need a background in every panel and you don't need, you know, more detail, more detail doesn't mean a better told story. In fact, usually doesn't mean better art. Even it means, um, you know, cause when you're doing a comic, the best way to tell a story is, you know, the most effective way, not the best looking way as far as efficiency. the most detailed. Yeah. There's a lot of people who still don't understand that. 
Yeah, the Even efficiency who, of telling a story visually. And people that kind who of thing. work in like comics, or, or rather, yeah, yeah. well, work in comics, but also like big time. Well, the big two. Viewers. Yeah, the, there's a lot of uh, probably people working in the big two who just think the whole point of drawing a comic is to make it look as elaborate as possible, when really it's to tell the best story possible. Well, what that. elicits an emotional reaction from your reader or your audience, whatever that may be. It's not necessarily the complexity of the visuals. Mm -hmm. It's the context and the weight of what's going on. There's this excellent animated film by Don Hertzfeld. Uh, he did that. Uh, he's done a bunch of funny cartoons, but it's called It's Such a Beautiful Day. Mm -hmm. And Hertzfeld's um, art style is basically stick figures. They have like oval bodies, but they're essentially stick figures. And that movie is really, really sad. It's basically about, about a guy suffering from it. It's implied to be brain cancer, and he's just slowly eroding throughout the course of the film. Mm -hmm. And even though the art style is so crude, um, it's it absolutely like tears you apart by the end because you understand the character. The character work is so good, and uh, the context of the story and the narrative is so solid that it doesn't matter that it's stick figures. Uh, you're still all broken up at the end of the movie when you know what happens happens. So. Yes, um, good art really it helps, but it it can't be hollow. There has to be a substance to it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to care about the characters, and you have to care about what happens to them, or else it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I like Alex Ross's art, uh, but Marvel's is a good story because it has a good script. Uh, Justice is not because Justice is just an episode of the Super Friends drawn by. Alex Ross painted by Alex Ross and, and it mm -hmm. kind of sucks. And I, I said, I said this before good. I said what? this before in other streams, but it gets me in trouble, but there's some Alex Ross works that are fully painted and I fall asleep reading them. <laughs> and it, it took me the longest time to be like, well, I like his art, but why am I falling asleep? And it's like, Oh, it's the same reason I fall asleep in a lot of art museums. I'm it's like my, I'm my, my it's very static portraits. looking sometimes. Well, it's, it's my visual cortex is overstimulated, and it's the idea that in a lot of Alex Ross paintings, there's a lot of squash and stretch that he can't do because his style is so solidified in realism that the fantastical is not given a lot of time to like breathe. Whereas in a lot of comic storytelling where um, art is more non-abstract, more quote unquote cartoony, um, you have a greater sense of dynamism because you're allowed to play with the laws of reality and how you mm -hmm. depict things. Yeah, there's there's um, uncanny valley kind of effects going on with that too. Yes, yes. There's um, there a link. If you guys want to look up in the chat, I think it's at 8.32 p.m. I posted this link. So I don't know. Maybe it's my sense of humor. But I, <laughs> when I saw this strip that he had posted, the floor, I couldn't stop laughing and I, I it was I didn't even make it past the first panel and I thought it was funny. So it's the Batman and Joker and they're florks, right? So they're sock puppets. And the first panel is the Joker and it just looks so silly because he has like these noodle arms and they're just like going up in the air. And the text says, "Whoa, look out, it's me the Joker. Whoa, mama." <laughs> and it's like you can hear that in your head because it's this very silly looking depiction of the Joker with like these noodle arms kind of doing something that I thought to myself, let's say I tried to draw that. Let's say someone had given me the same script, but not said, okay, Tim, I want you to draw this like a sock puppet. Just draw it in your style. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't come across the same way because I can't do the whole noodle arm thing. Like I would be drawing him with at the most like jazz hands. Like I would have him just like flashing them at the camera, but it's, it's that comedic timing that he had where it's like, I don't know. I wouldn't even hear the Joker in my head saying, whoa, mama. But it's <laughs> just like, well, that would make sense because this thing is like waving its noodle arms in the air. So Wacky inflatable waving arm noodle guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of like those things that you see at car washes and yeah. um, as a sales tactic. And, and you couldn't have Alex Ross uh, draw this either or, or paint it because it really wouldn't look the same either in that case. Right. And so um, the next part panel is Batman. He's like, not so fast, Joker. You don't stand a chance against my ba new bat suit, which has like big nipples like sticking out of it. Just freakish nipples. <laughs> and it's just the Joker. Like it just ends with a close up of the Joker and his, his pupils are just like looking at it like, 
what? <laughs> like that's just it. That's the the copy paste of like the first panel just zoomed in, which is all the thing is that's like the old meme too. That's like going back to sort of V comics and Fortran and that kind of stuff, where stuff was just that simple, and you realize how much it still works. In fact, probably works better than like professionally made art. In fact, well, um, it's something. It goes back to something that when you you guys and we were first talking, something that y'all had brought up was this idea of, and you hear it all the time in uh, semantic arguments. They're like, our web comics, comics, like whatever. And it's like, I don't care what you call it. It's a sequential storytelling style, whether it be yeah. comic strips, comic books, comics in the newspaper. I don't care. We're all talking Image about- Image macros and memes. I consider those comics tech. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's what I was going to point out was mm -hmm. you were one of the first people that we had heard who said, anytime you have an image macro, a meme, a Wojak thing going on, mm -hmm. that's essentially a comic. Yeah. Like that's essentially what's happening. Um, it's just that the visual format and its presentation is just different than what you might be used to when you think of a quote unquote comic book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's inherently self-limiting to only consider a comic to be like a physical book or even, a, you know, any kind of book with images. It's well, like it's, it is a, a form of snobbish elitism. Yeah, there's like yeah. somebody's like, oh, web comics aren't comics. It's kind of bougie. Oh, yeah, you get into like, it's not a real comic. And then yeah. someone has to define for you what a real comic is. Yeah, and, I and mean, then you there realize are they have no idea like, what they're uh, talking about. You know, you get someone like John Kirk Falusi who says that um, if it uses a script, it's not a real cartoon. And that's like his, his criteria for what a real cartoon is. And people are like that with comics, like, oh, you know, it's not they're a worse real with comics. Comic. If yeah. Any, yeah, they're really <laughs> people, uh, especially lately, perhaps, but maybe always, have been really bad. Yeah, with well, since when so are since when can a, a cartoon not have a script? Yeah, exactly. why does it need to not have a script? That doesn't make sense. Or even well, why would it need to have a script? It's like the other way around. It's like Looney Tunes. Yeah, uh, not yeah, the, need a script. Or are the Looney well, that's Tunes the thing. Bad? So there, there's board driven and there's script driven. Looney Tunes and Red and Stimpy, those short format uh, gag and slapstick uh, heavy animations, those are board driven, in which case the artist just draws funny pictures in the storyboard and then that gets adapted by the animators. Script driven is more like, you know, a half hour like Batman the Animated Series or The Simpsons or something where it's got a complex story. If it's an ongoing series, you know, it's got continuity and character development, things like that. Rock of like, Martin Life seem, seems like both. Yeah, in a way. Well, a lot of cartoons, I think, are just written by scripts. It's, and, you know, there will yeah, be start some scripts. of them that are made with uh, storyboards. But a storyboard, you know, a series of storyboards is really just a visual version of a script anyway. It, so, it's yeah. a comic, essentially, because it has the yeah. box on the top that has the picture. And then it does have uh, lines on the bottom that have the text, like the dialogue mm -hmm. and the instructions for the animator. Yeah. So it's essentially they're they're taking a comic book and they're putting it um, into animation. That's all an animatic really ends up being is a motion comic. Mm -hmm. but I've, there's done, this, I've made this... comics both ways too with uh, uh, yeah. like story or like I've, I've made comics where I would just write or I would draw like a picture. I would just come up with it on the fly and just do a doodle. And then I've also done it where I would write a full script. You know, I actually made a comic uh, yesterday. Oh, what did it, was it yesterday? Oh yeah. Yeah. Or it was the day before I think the one that was the, the thing, wasp. you know, because it doesn't need to be well drawn, so it's just a, a it's just a wasp. Yeah, just a doodle of wasps. There's where is that? Did, oh, I'm yeah. gonna post it in the in the. Yeah, where is it? Where's the where? Yeah, did you post know, it, it to yeah, Twitter? Self or art? No. Well, it's uh, on I'm, my Twitter, I'm, and it's I'm also taking, on self art. I'm taking no. I'm I'm posting this this link into the group chat for this other strip. Um, Mark and I laugh at. It's a running gag, so he'll pull out the same conclusion for a lot of them, but in this strip. There's a, um, I think it was for Christmas, the ghost of Christmas past comes to visit and it's like, Ooh, it's me, the ghost of Christmas past. And then it just gets like erased and it just says bang. And then it's um, a famous, they they use it in a lot of memes where it's the floor and it's a Texan and he holds a shotgun. And it just says y'all in my house, touching my stuff, my stuff in my house. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. And it's just funny whenever it pops up because like you see it happen a time and time again. And um, going to like simplicity versus complexity, I was thinking about it because I thought, what if this was more simple? Would it be just as funny? Like, what if we broke it down to just a stick figure where it's like a stick figure with no face and a gun like shooting at it? 
And my conclusion, you guys might disagree with me, is it would not be as funny because you have to have like the image of the character making that specific face for it to be humorous. Um, in that case, like an oversimplification of it would not necessarily pull it off. So what I think is, again, like when we're talking to people, like for example, we're at this convention this weekend and we had some people asking us for advice in terms of uh, what to do. And we had both artists and writers, but I think the ones who were kind of lacking in self-confidence are a lot of the writers because they're like, well, I want to get this off the ground, but I can't afford an artist. And I'm like, well, how much is your artist like going to charge you? And, you know, they said something like 200 to $400 a page. And it's like, well, what's your book about? How long is it? Oh, it's like a slice of life romance story. It's going to be, I don't know, at this point, I just want to get off the ground. So maybe 24, 30 pages. And I'm like, you don't need a $400 artist. You just need someone who can draw um, pretty, lo pretty looking people standing around and talking to each other. But theoretically, even if you can't draw, you could just try it yourself. I mean, yeah. How good is the story? Yeah, and that's the that's the core thing that I if your story, to go back yeah, to. if your story is really good, if your characters are doing legitimately interesting stuff or relatable stuff or whatever, yeah, you could just do it in MS Paint. That's all you need to do. Another uh, comparison we we're going to bring up was um, it's a romance slice of life. I mean, about what? Because yeah. that's something that's been done to death. Who needs who needs good art to tell that though? Anyways, but uh, well, besides besides the, the quality of the story, just looking at the genre itself size of life romance a lot of it is i mean i hate to say it, a lot of it's quote unquote talking heads that's what yeah. happens a lot of the time is it's just you know boy girl talking to each other a lot of conversation and stuff like that you have to maybe draw ambient backgrounds um to get the sense of where they are but the idea is that shoot you're not trying to draw like i mean i think the worst things to draw are like military settings because i mean the people who read military books, a lot of them are in the military and they'll get you for stuff where it's like, hey, like that, um, like the ejection ports on the wrong side. Like, mm -hmm. why did you draw it over there? So then you have this. Uh, it's a storytelling medium where detail is like of paramount importance. But in terms of like human relationships and just kind of cutesy pie drama and whatnot. No, I don't think you need it to be over overly complex. I mean, look at most newspaper comic strips, like three panel comic strips, Peanuts, Garfield, mm -hmm. Pearls Before Swine. It, these characters are incredibly simple and there's no backgrounds. It's just a solid color. If it's a, if it's a daily strip, there's no color at all. And OK, not most of them aren't funny, but they still exist. Some of them are funny. I mean, I'll there. It's like a Heathcliff comic. It'll just be Heathcliff walking down the streets in his crude drawing with a T-shirt that says "I'm bad news" and some crudely okay. drawn old man in the background saying "He's bad news." Bad news. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you're laughing. I hear that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you, you I, don't I remember have to have, it. Yeah. yeah, like this. I mean, and that's been like the rule of of newspaper comics since they've been a medium going back over a hundred years. So the idea that it's not good art unless it's like super high detail that it can't mm -hmm. convey a joke or it can't convey an emotion or get a reaction from you just isn't true. There's um uh the, the latest uh episode of literally because I I posted the first issue to Webtoon basically because it's been a few years and um I decided I wanted to sort of make a promotional sort of prequel episode just on my own just because like well i can draw this and i'm just relying on myself to draw I, and i can't draw at all but i can still draw this i can still doodle this so i made um a prequel episode of literally that's on the webtoon and also on tapas and i just drew it myself and it's, it's very googly and, and woobly and all that shit but um it you know it still works because all the, and it's funny how many people I saw other artists saw um, and in a weird way were inspired like I got fan art from other artists because of this episode that's just very simple goofy doodle art. Um, I could you know what it reminds here. me of? Oh, it reminds me of you know um, One Punch Man. You have yeah exactly. Long the manga right now, it's actually a remake of the one of the, there's actually two concurrent ones going on. You have the manga put up by Shonen Jump and that's actually illustrated by Yusuke Murata. Mm -hmm. um, and the story is done by a guy who goes by pseudonym one. But all of those are based on one's own strips where he draws them by himself. 
and they are crude. Like they're very, very. Yeah, those very, are very wobbly and stuff. And yeah, those are just straight up doodles. But you could tell he's putting his work into it. And that, yeah, he posted that just as a web comic, and yes. it blew up enough. And they're hysterical. Um, they're funnier than mm -hmm. the actual manga itself. And and again, I think he gets to have his cake and eat it too. Because on one hand, with Yusuke Murata's art, it's the fleshed out world where it's like, nah, this is a real vibrant place like you do want to spend a lot of time looking at the action because there are there is a lot of um detail that serves the action that's needed something that he can't pull off but the comedy aspect of it i think he pulls off better because the art is so um basic and so um simple in terms of well, that's part of the presented. joke in the original uh in the original art uh, not just the original web comic. some of the best parts of the the manga itself or the, or the the anime the redo yeah the redo and the anime know. are when the art itself reduces back to really simplistic it became yes. memes and stuff and that's something that manga seems to be able to do we all expect it to do mm -hmm. it and it's just become a hallmark of it is that when they want to convey a joke or make a moment stand out with impact, they'll do the chibi super deformed thing for just a panel or just one yeah. character in the background of the panel. It becomes and mega simplistic and right? it, to work more efficiently to convey it. That's where like the opposite of, of a detailed art is the superior choice. It really, it's, you know, kind of a, just a different tool in out of many many different kinds of tools that you, you know you can't do that in a in like a batman comic right mm -hmm. you can't uh have like i don't know mr freeze saying like this is the end batman you can't defeat me and then batman doing that one punch man thing where he turns into a crew drawing and goes mm -hmm. okay like <laughs> you're not gonna do that and, in a batman and, uh, comic they all, all have to stay rigidly on model constantly <laughs> that's the other thing is that the like in that kind of thing the background also would just be all white yeah. There would be no background because a background would, you know, a de especially a detailed background, but really any background at all would detract from the humor of that panel. And that's, again, it's another example of how, um, like, it, that's what we've, we've been saying this for uh, so many years going back, like before 2018 even. Uh, it was what some of our original posts were about is that they actually understand visual storytelling in comics a lot better than a lot of American creators and fans alike who just think that, you know, more detailed art is therefore better in every single case all the time. When, um, in fact, usually a lot of the comics with the most detailed art are the perfect example of how it doesn't work and why it, it you know they're usually those stories are not good at all um but they're also not even told well because it's just about showing a bunch of flashy art instead of telling a good story there's a um there was a stream i did with uh george alexopoulos and we talked about this because um like for example whenever i'm asked to teach kids um art classes typically in the summer i explain to them this kind of very big concept called pareidolia and i was telling the guys this weekend like doug and mark so what i do the way i start out because you know how kids are i mean I, a lot of adults are like this too it's like oh i can't draw i can't learn it's talent whatever mm -hmm. and I, I don't believe any of that i'm like no i think it's a it's a once you find out like this perspective of looking at it i think it completely changes how you look at drawing so what i do is i'll, I'll take like on a whiteboard i'll put a circle in it and I'll, I'll draw a circle and i'll say oh what is this and they'll say oh it's a circle and then the circle i'll put a dot and i'll say what is that and they'll say it's a dot it's in the circle i'm like okay and then i'll draw another dot and then i'll ask them what it is and they say oh it's another dot and i'll draw a curved line under it and i'll say what is this and they'll say it's a smiley face <laughs> and i'm like no it's a circle two dots and a curve your brain has um, is wired for pattern recognition, and so the phenomenon is called pareidolia. It's our our um, our tendency to see things in things that are not actually there. It's the reason why you see forms in clouds. A cloud goes by, and you're like, "Oh, that looks like my Uncle Joe," or "That looks like a dog," or whatever. There's not really a dog up there. It's just our tendency is to want to do that. So, in essence, what you do when you draw is you're creating an elaborate magic trick where you're like, can I have this person fall for it? 
to think that they're actually engaged in a story when in reality there's nothing there. It's just a an intelligent combination of lines mm -hmm. to deceive the human brain into seeing something uh, there where it's not. So my wife, for example, she doesn't read manga, she doesn't watch anime, and she didn't grow up reading comics. So when she first started, she was like, "Oh, I have to kind of." I had to explain to her like okay this is a thought balloon so that's the reason why like the balloon has like cloud a cloud feature mm -hmm. to it is because they're thinking but then when I, when she had to go read manga it was like oh like what's going on here why does this this person have like um four cross points leading into their head and i'm like well what's going on right now and she's like i think they're pissed off and i'm like that's a shorthand for someone who's like really like mad it's supposed to be the veins on their head and they're throbbing and she's like oh i kind of like that because it's cute because you're able to tell at a glance like if you know that visual language you know this person is mad that's mm -hmm. why there's that there yeah, yeah. This shorthand or even mental shorthand yeah right and I, I think now for some people i think it makes them mad so for example um i was listening to professor geek a few years ago he was uh, reviewing matt weldon's punchline book and he was like I hate how this character has this giant sweat bead like over her head. And I was like, okay, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to criticize the criticism, but I'm like, that's a visual shorthand that they do in manga. I mm -hmm. think it works. Like, I think it's great for the type of storytelling that needs to be done because it's to show that she's embarrassed or flustered or whatever. Well, e even all those little anime reaction things that we've come to get used to, like the giant sweat bead, those are all imported from American comics. So Floyd Gottfredson, who did the Mickey Mouse comic for Walt Disney that goes back to the 20s, he was the mm -hmm. first one to draw Mickey reacting by having just like five little tiny sweat drops pop out of his head when he was startled. And, and they'd be flying kind of, out. Yeah, I yeah, remember that. Like in five different directions, just as a way mm -hmm. of showing he's like, yikes, and is, he's nervous. And then that got imported to Japan when they got those comics. They streamlined it down to just one big sweat drop or comics like i think it was floyd gofferson as well like whenever goofy would say something stupid mickey mouse would like lean back with his hand on his head like face palming he's like oh like he's about to faint and that got adapted into manga and anime as like oh is someone surprised so they just all like fall over and face plant with surprise mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like parodying like taking it to a next extreme to parody the original it's trope. like one it's one step away from it too though it's not even yeah. an extreme it's yeah. just one step further it's almost like a telephone game it's just each one is just adapting it and now it's yeah. become our like it's all just evolved from that old visual shorthand it's, it's kind of like how cartoon hearts don't look like a human yeah. heart at all yeah mm -hmm. but we all know it uh, what it is it's like oh that's a heart when you draw one of those little things like you know what that means oh it means love or it means you know something like that and even though it, that's not what it visually looks like a heart i mean we're talking about flork and we talk about how funny his drawings are but he does like different genres with his sock puppets and he do ones that can gross you out even though the the drawings are so crude and mm -hmm interpretistic so like he did one where there's a coroner who's growing onions in a human corpse or a sock puppet corpse <laughs> and it's just like a squiggly line with green squiggly lines like uh onion grass coming out of it as the guy's watering it and i remember reading that and being grossed out like just the the idea that it imparted on you of growing vegetables out of human flesh just grossed me out when you look at the drawing, though, it, it's just these little, like, uh, four lines of green sticking up out of, like, one line of red. But you put the part, the pieces together in your mind, and you create the more uh, rich visual in your head they, of, 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 you know, vegetables coming out of human flesh. Yeah. Are they smelly onions? Or, or <laughs> was it, was it, because that's usually the, oh, it's the lines, it's like stink. Stink lines, or, or something it's like just that. grass yeah, yeah. lines, but like, yeah, or like just the, actual, almost, yeah, stems, body like horror, that. even from like a, a very simplistic art style. It translates, it's just, it, I was also thinking from the purpose of like pure imagination, it's like, you know, also, if you lock somebody in a dark room with no sound, they'll just start to hallucinate naturally. Yeah. If well, if it has like the absence of the actual absence of, you know, yeah, uh, sensory, yeah, they're, called, they're called anechoic chambers, and yeah, you will mm -hmm. go crazy because, yeah, or sensory there's... deprivation, yeah, yeah the, the chambers in, too. Uh, I think there's one in Vanderbilt, an anechoic chamber. I've had some colleagues who have been in it, and you, you stay there for a few seconds or a few minutes, and I mean, you start hearing, you swear you hear like blood going through your veins because mm -hmm. there's no other sound other than 
that of the human body and then you yeah because realize... soundproof too it's yeah it's well, soundproof. yeah it's got those it's yeah it has those soundproofing on the walls that kind of stuff that just absorb sound so much that the room itself is like negative 17 decibels or something this is for uh mark uh, he has two comments i think he can address first ray cortex one of my favorite artists who did mm. a simple detail thing is sam keith i don't know enough about sam keith to address that would that. go kind of back and forth yeah I've, i recognize that uh, the second one is adam winters who says walt disney gave us manga in, a, in kind of a roundabout way because yeah the Japanese are very, very good at reverse engineering. And I, I'm pretty sure there's people, historians who have done better research on this than I have. And I know Mark can speak to it, but essentially, yeah. I mean, I, I know that Disney cartoons were very popular in Japan. The Japanese kind of took the aesthetic of like, hey, you know, to make people pretty or cute, you make their eyes bigger. And then obviously they did that. And then we kind of took some of that and kind of engineered it for ourselves. And then we kind of played this mm -hmm. telephone game. Yeah, it went I, back I talked and forth. To, I had talked to the Roy Loops before about this, where I had noticed, like, especially in the 90s, I freaking hated, like, the art style of things like Slayers, where, like, the eyes were so big oh, that yeah. they took up, like, half the head. That took yeah. it too far. I didn't care for that design myself either. Well, I and was then, like, oh. <laughs> but I noticed that over time, they kind of shrank, and they shrank mm -hmm. to, like, kind of a... Right now, they're at a place where I think it's, like, a happy medium, where it's, like, the aesthetic is still there, where there's a lot of emphasis on the eyes, but they were like, all right, let's... uh dial it back a bit because it, it doesn't look you know it doesn't look that great as far yeah, as it, 90s anime and, and that kind of style just like at that point didn't even have any control it was just trying to push the idea of the style as far as humanly possible with some artists anyways but um yeah. adam, adam winter says a disney paid mm. japan back by ripping off kim but i read this yeah. article i want to say it was uh snopes but don't quote me on that it was like did Disney rip off Kimba? Mm. False. And so I read it, and I was like, I don't know how you came up with false. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah, it, it's did. it's kind of an open secret that, yeah, they did. But at the same time, it was almost like, well, you know, Osamu Tezuka, mm -hmm. would he really be upset because he was such a Disney fanboy? And he adapted yeah. so many of his own ideas straight from uh, Disney cartoons and Disney comics. Yeah, that's that, what I heard a lot. Of, like that, paying him back. <laughs> yeah, Tezuka uh, was so massively influenced by Disney. So it was like a lot of anime and manga essentially came from Disney through Tezuka. But um I did see the uh, Your Movie Sucks did uh, actually a giant comparison between Kimba and The Lion King. And uh, act he, he actually goes over much better detail of how The Lion King is it, not just coincidental, uh, but actually it was Kimba that stole from The Lion King because all the things that looked similar were from a uh, Kimba movie that was made after The Lion King came out. Oh, and okay. A lot of people don't point that out either. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, the no one idea. that I especially appreciated was where he's pointing out just uh, it's like, oh, nobody's ever stood on a cliff and looked down before. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, again, that scene that's like, oh, it's so similar. It's like, yeah, that was from a Kimbo movie that came out after the line. And then he showed like 10 examples from just any other media of the exact same thing. Yeah. Where, where people were like, oh, this is ripping off Kimba. And it's just like, no, here's here's all these things, and they all predate Kimba, where somebody is standing on a cliff or something and looking down. Well, there's also uh, falling off a cliff. It's like, oh, the Lion King got that from Kimba because it happened all the time in the Kimba cartoons. So he does a compilation of all the time somebody falls off a cliff in the Kimba cartoons, and it goes on for like ten straight minutes, and it's <laughs> and it's just looping one of this some of the music from Kimba. And eventually it's to the point where it's like, oh, this music's actually really catchy. <laughs> and so, and so at music. the end, yeah, at the end, he's like, check out the Kimba soundtrack from the TV show. It's actually pretty good. There was something I wanted to bring up as we um, close it down here in the last few minutes. So um, the reason I wanted to have these two guys on is because they have, a, again, a book that they created a few years ago called Literally. And it was one of the funniest books that I had read that year. And in terms of plot, it was very unique um, compared to what was in the market for independent comics. So it just still is you... in a way. It's still unique. It, it's really changed <laughs> that. No, yeah. Just, well, nobody's, nobody's learned a lesson yet. Just to give exactly. kind of uh, a summary of what the book is about. It's about this girl, this little girl named Helen. 
and she goes to school and she lives kind of a very typical life, but she's nerdy, she's awkward and whatever. But halfway through the book, she goes on these really grand adventures with like giant mechs and she goes to an alternate world where she has to fight bad guys and whatnot. And kind of the beauty of it is at the end of the book, you're, the reader is not quite sure whether or not it's in her mind or if it's in, if it's real. And even though I hate the comparison of like X meets Y, mm -hmm. it essentially takes a very Calvin and Hobbes-esque perspective and almost turns it on its head in terms of um, you use the same charm um, that has been utilized in the past to failure. A lot of times people try it and it just sucks. Like, for example, I remember the movie North. I don't know why the heck we watched oh, it. God. It was so bad because I was like, so, but I you admit, you admit the whole thing is a dream. <laughs> like, so you wasted the audience's time essentially. Like, this is so bad. Mm -hmm. But I remember, like, I think um, us and Doug to Naple had read it and we're like, no, this is legitimately funny for your, for the price you paid for it. I mean, shoot, knock mm -hmm. yourself out. Like, this is great. But I had remembered that some of your detractors were like, the art is awful. Like, look at this. And I remember thinking, I, vehemently disagree with that synopsis because it's like i think i've seen the artist's work i've seen how they draw this is the style they chose because it fits perfectly with what's going on like there's one panel i can't show it because it's it's slightly not safe for work but it's basically like this teacher this uh cheerleader is like picking on her and she essentially powers up to the point where like in the super, she goes saiyan, super saiyan yeah yeah it's actually in the uh it, it's in the trailer which is um i think on the campaign if you scroll down to the bottom of the literally two campaign was the trailer for literally one which contains like that scene a sort of animated version of the comic well, in a way someone had said like oh look at her boobs they're like they're they're perking up to the point where they're like rockets like they're they're elongated like that's just exactly. bad art i was like that was done on purpose like that yeah, was that, that's that the was thing the is simplicity that simplicity of storytelling like the idea was that it's a visual gag. Like mm -hmm. she's powering up, like, you know, we, we've seen her skirts flying times. up to her skirts flying up on its own because she's going so super sane with being how, how much of a Valley girl she's, she's screaming whatever so hard that it's making her go super. That's part of the joke. And I understand that going over a lot of people's heads and a lot of people, the, really? the majority of people got it, of course. Well, I think so. that a lot of people who may have not gotten it, I'm like, have you read just nothing but superhero books like your whole life that every, that yes. you never, have you, yes. and then yes. it dawned on me. I was like, <laughs> if you're 30, if you're 30 and younger, there's actually a good chance you've never read a comic strip like in your life mm -hmm. because of, because newspapers are, you know, for lack of a better word, are considered an antiquity. Yeah. Um, but it's like if you've read anything that is outside of the big two, anything that's even a web comic, you should know that there are principles of squash and stretch that you use for comedic effect sometimes. Like what is even the argument otherwise? To well, it's not. It's not an art. argument. Of course, it's a. That's it's the thing that we've also art. pointed out is yes. that it's just a complaint and not a critique. And most people don't even know the difference between those two things either, especially in comics. Well, there's so there's other parts of it. So I was listening to some critiques, and some of it's like, oh my gosh, look at the background. There's like hardly any color. It's just white with some splotches of, um, mm -hmm. of blue and and green to tell where it is. I'm like. I had ne it never occurred oh. to me because that was not important. You had already known that she's in school or she's yeah. out it's of almost school. like they're, they're scrambling to find something to Yeah, they're just about. looking for something to be. I don't even know if it's that. I really do think that they just, I really do think that they just have not seen well, it's like that the, type of um, storytelling before. American comic book fan spotted. That's really what it is. I'll tell you this funny one. So um, there's a book I'm reading right now. It just started. So I think it's only in volume four, but it's a book called Happy Conico's Killer Life. And I think it started as a webcomic in Japan. And it's about a salary woman who by accident becomes a hitman completely by luck. Like she, she, she just happens to be unlucky and kills people by accident. So people think that she is like this genius. But um, I was talking to Tyler Carpenter and he was like, did you notice that they just recycle the same uh, image over and over again and just changed like the mouth and the face and stuff? And I was like, no, it never dawned on me because I was having too much fun reading it that I don't care. Like, I don't care about, um, you know, if they do that or I not. I remember not... that, actually. It's, mm -hmm. They're very simple gag strips almost. But, yeah, they also tell a story. In each I've seen that commonly. Yeah, you actually kind of see that a lot with, um, well, with webcomics, especially because that's kind of part of the joke to Control some extent. 
Control Alt Delete. Yeah. Well, then, no, yeah. That's the joke was different control, example. Delete. Actually, yeah. I was thinking because the the comic you're mentioning, it's like, oh yeah, it's because it, every day of hers is the same. Otherwise, because she's a salary woman. Yeah. Yeah. She's a typical uh, office lady, businesswoman. Where it's, it's uh, yeah, the joke of that's kind of communicated by like sort of copy and pasting the art. Right, the, the the mendacity of everyday life has yeah. has a degree of repetition, so it's like it works in its favor as far as storytelling is concerned. Um, and I was like, well, it's a good thing like Tyler has good taste, <laughs> so uh, we, we weren't gonna have the argument. But I just thought I could imagine someone being like, oh my gosh, like this is such a rip off. Like I can't believe that they're repeating it. They're they're ripping you off because like you're just getting the same thing over and over. And I'm like, look, I can get it if you like. Let's say you tell someone. Oh, it's gonna take me a year to make this book because my gosh, the art is so complex. And then that's what you pull, right? Like mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's the reason I'm late. And then people can call you out on it because they're like, no, you didn't. Like you just ended up copy pasting. But just in the normal course of storytelling, if you do that, I'm not gonna fault you for it because it's like, mm -hmm. heck, I didn't even notice until someone pointed it out. Even if I do notice, it's like if it's you know to some it, if it's for any purpose or even if it's for no purpose. Like sometimes when an artist is late, like Control Alt Delete is just an example of the artist being lazy and dragging and dropping you know art assets yeah, uses, or mouths and that kind of thing. Using clip art, yeah, yeah, just dragging and dropping clip art. But um, yeah, and, and the, and another point I would do want to throw out is that the the better uh, comics aren't inherently japanese it's just that there's a different uh there's sort of a more advanced understanding and it's not just from the japanese it's now from a lot of people who are growing up reading those comics or other comics or indie comics or web comics. Well, there's a lot of web comics out there that have nothing to do with manga or japanese style in any way that have an understanding of how a you know detailing the background takes away visually from what's actually happening in the comic or why it's not necessary to show every angstrom of every twig on the ground or whatever <laughs> now unless you're matt weldon who just does that instinctively so I, I don't want to detract from people who do do that but there's a, a finesse to it there's mm -hmm. there's a degree to which you feel like it's necessary and where the artist just wants to put in flourish because it's part of their work it's complicated um, it really is a, a, a lot of there, i mean there's you know a million different ways to make a comic well there's one like i'll, I'll point it out that <laughs> i know someone's going to use it in a future video but i don't care um a, a lot of people ask how i work fast and the reality is i cheat a lot and by that i don't do anything like i don't use 3d models or anything like that everything is hand drawn but i'll tell you a very simple one uh typically if we're in a if we're going to be in a setting for two pages, you'll notice that I put a lot of work in the first panel's background. So let's say we're in we're in Carly's house. I will draw and render that living room like it's important, like it's really, really important that they're there. But you'll notice that every subsequent panel that's in the shot, I'll blur out the background. Um, I'll basically just use airbrushes to do it. And that saves me a lot of time because it's like, you already know that you're in there. There's no mm -hmm. need to draw every portrait that's in the background yeah or the location is established once the location's established you don't really need to see it anymore but right if you don't draw the living room in every single panel how will i know they're still in the living room <laughs> yeah, they're, are they still in the living room they're still well, that's, in a the room. that's a major plot hole yeah you you just did a huge plot hole. the catastrophic blunder of the century on, on the other hand um there's another artist i was talking to and what happened was um, he want, he had this like high fantasy idea and he needed some advice because he was like, there's something wrong with like the, the deck of this galleon. Uh, what is it? And I said, well, is the galleon staffed or is it one guy who's, who's on it? And he was like, no, there's supposed to be like a crew. And I was like, well, where's the crew? You haven't drawn any of the crew there yet. Like, it's just one guy who's on the deck. And it's like, oh crap. Like I didn't even think about that. Cause I was too worried thinking like, oh my gosh, you mean to tell me I have to draw every single guy? I was like, no, there's some ways you can cheat. If you have a close-up shot, you just have to draw you just have to draw three guys and then some silhouettes in the background. The yeah. reader will understand there's people there. Some vague what, figure. Yeah, if you draw a figure shaped shape, that's really all you need. Yeah. And then what you do is on the shot of the deck, you can just draw in like dark shapes to just show that they're there because these people mm -hmm. aren't important. You but the reader is not gonna care because if the story is moving along, honestly, they're spending about 60 to 70 percent of the time reading the text 
and 30 percent of the time looking at the art um and in that case they're not going to care and what they're going to do is if they go back and they're going to say hey you didn't draw every single face in there they're not going it's not going to be a nitpick yeah. on their part yeah that's that's uh that's yeah, again that would be just a complaint as opposed to a critique if somebody was like you didn't draw every single person and if you spent the time drawing every detail of every single person the the reader and you were saying this before the show the reader's going to spend the same amount of time reading that page or that panel than they would if there was no detail at all they would just look at it for like a uh, maybe one extra second at most if there was more detail but really the more detail usually the faster you're trying to just read <laughs> through it because then your eyes are just getting bombarded with uh extraneous detail that you I, really don't need i remember this <laughs> i just remembered this incident that happened there was a guy online who doesn't like my art which is fine i never went to art school i'm sure my art sucks to a lot of people i honestly don't know what i'm doing but this guy he didn't like my art, but there was another guy whose art he did like. And this guy is pretty well known for a lot of rendering, a lot of cross hatching and whatnot. And I remember one time he had posted a series, a th a, like a, a tweet thread where he was like, I just got this in the mail. I'm so excited. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to live tweet it as we go. And I was like, this should be interesting. <laughs> I want, I'm just paying attention to the tweet where he ends. And sure enough, he ended it about 12 minutes into it. He was like, that was a great read. I loved it. And I was like, it literally took you as much time to read a really rendered comic as it did to read either of mine or any of yours or anyone else's. I mean, it was yeah. an average amount of time it takes a reader. Yeah, you didn't it. dwell and soak in the imagery. The, like the the comics that where I've really uh, soaked in the imagery and, and looked at them was usually Calvin and Hobbes, which yes. has incredibly simple art anyways. Yes, absolutely. And it's deceptively simple. Mm -hmm. um, I know one person who I think we were talking about your strip in particular. I was like, you ever read Calvin and Hobbes? Because it's like, oh, yeah, it was great. Watterson was a master. And I was like, Calvin's feet were literally dinner rolls. Just dinner rolls. In fact, it was Charles Schultz who pointed out that he actually really liked the little dinner roll quality of Calvin's shoes. Right. Um, and which is which is a good thing. I mean, it goes to I, show I used, that's all you need. I used I used the the art of Calvin and Hobbes to draw trees. Because the way he draws trees is simple too. He just draws. But they look fantastic, branches. though. Yeah. He draw. He just draws enough of the branch work, and then takes a watercolor brush, and just dips watercolor into it to create the illusion of foliage. Mm -hmm. He doesn't it's draw every like, leaf individually. And it's not like Watterson couldn't draw. I mean, how many of those awesome Sunday strips that he would have, like you know, Calvin's yeah. imaginary world, where like a T Rex is flying a, a fighter yeah, jet or something, yeah, and it looks. And it looks fucking awesome. Or Spaceman's uh, Spiff fighting aliens. Yeah. And uh, Florks com is like that too. I mean, he. Yeah, I the noticed. The we no can we really noticed, draw too. Yeah, he can draw really well. And the first time I, at least I noticed that he noticed us. That Senpai noticed us <laughs> was he drew this really excellent drawing of Common America. Common America, I remember. And that then too. he drew in the bottom corner the sock puppet. Yes. Common America. <laughs> and, it, and the thing is, the sock like, puppet version is actually cool. It's cooler to see the sock puppet version of Common America because it's in that style that you like from the comic yeah. that you already like. Yeah. yeah, it's really cute too. And the contrast the contrast actually makes it cooler too of the yeah, high he... detail stuff versus the, <laughs> the floor I don't version. think he would mind me saying this, but he and I talk and uh, he was like hey, what tips do you uh, have for like improving on art? And I was like, <laughs> if it's for your strip, I'm not going to give you advice because I don't know why you'd want to change anything. Like the strip art is fine as it is. In fact, it's excellent. It's it's. Uh, if anything, it's, he should be giving you advice. He should be giving. No, <laughs> he needs to because. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He actually, I, I, I unironically agree with that. I have, I have tried drawing the flork in the way he does it and it mm. never looks the same. I was yeah. like, it, the, some of his characters when he draws them like you just want to hug them because they look so cute and i have tried inside. yeah yeah i have tried and i'm like nah there's something wrong like the eyes are too high mm -hmm. or the the mouth isn't long enough or he's not round enough like i don't know like what's going on so it's not an easily duplicable thing it, it's deceptively simple like for example someone in the chat recently they were posted they said like hey yeah charlie brown is essentially a circle I actually thought Charlie Brown was more effective in his original incarnation than the later peanut strips because he was simpler. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the old design. squashed circle look with a very simple uh sweater that was just zigzags up and down that's right, right. and he had like, no wolves art uh no he had those um, pie uh, eyes yeah. too yeah uh, like a classic like cuphead pie like not yeah, classic and he was cuphead. balding yeah nope full is actually another good that's an artist that we know and he's on uh twitter and he just posts doodles but they're all like cute and happy and they're very simplistic and it's like it reminds me of um something i've been uh, like tr almost trying to bring up the entire show the entire past hour no! but, um, scott mcleod uh did this book called understanding comics in like the early 90s and he makes a lot of points about how expressions actually are better and more functional like facial expressions are more expressive the simpler the face is like a smiley face is essentially the most perfect example of a facial expression with the two dots and one curve it it portrays a facial expression in the most perfect way whereas the more detailed the face is the less effective it is at evoking or portraying an emotion and i think there's a lot of really good points in it i know some people are like oh scott mcleod you know, he there's a lot of room for error the more the more daring you are in terms of trying to emote mm -hmm. the more potential there is that you're going to mess it up there was a when mark and i were reading a lot of like transformers comics um what was it it was called dull surprise like it was a meme oh, in the early 2000s yeah, yeah yeah that was um pat lee was pat style. lee because yeah. when pat lee would draw people um he just had this this look where they called it dull surprise because it was almost like an MST3K reference. I'm yeah, that's an MST3K reference uh, from I forgot what episode, but was it, it was the uh, Kathy Ireland movie. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe a uh, girl from LA or whatever, or yeah, alien, from alien from LA, <laughs> where it was that, like, yeah. what if what expression is she trying to portray here? And every single one of them was dull surprise. <laughs> it's a game show, it was a game yeah. show where they're yeah. trying to guess what is her facial expression, what what is she, what is she what trying is she to portray here? here, yeah, emotionally here. And that is, yeah, that's almost like the default for, well, that's the thing is that I think a lot of comic artists try and draw from like generic, they're trying to draw actual people instead of trying to draw comics. And that's one of the biggest flaws a comic artist can make is trying to make their comic look realistic. When like Alex Ross was another example. And uh, there's also that the actual um, civil war comic from the early two thousands with uh uh, was it Mark Millar wrote oh, that? Yeah, yeah. But the art for that, like, it just made me laugh when I saw, like, after a kindergarten gets blown up and 200 children are vaporized, all of the superheroes are in costume in, like, <laughs> one room in the Baxter building. And it's drawn to look realistic, and it looks so stupid. It's, like, painful to look at. Captain America's <laughs> outfit looks really dumb when you do it, that. It looks yeah. garish because yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, in it's, it's ugly. It's awkward. It, you know, all the body suits and stuff. It's I was like, reading all something. All of this where... works better in just a cartoony style. Somebody really was does. like, why does Captain America have little bell-bottom cuffs on his boots? Well, yeah. it reminds when, me of... When did that... he start doing this? And it's like, from the beginning, that was always yeah. how he looked. Uh, remember when... At, right after 9-11, Marvel put out that, like, the Marvel Universe reacts to 9-11 yeah, comic. Dr. Doom Doctor, was crying and shit. Dr. Doom crying, and he's like, yeah. not like this, not like this. <laughs> and I just, it was unintentionally yeah. funny because it was those characters, even though the <laughs> Thank you, Marvel, it, for making 9-11 funny again. I know. It's, it's like you look at it now, and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, it's, it's taking itself so seriously, but with these characters that are inherently goofy. And I know that with, with superheroes, you know, I'm sick, too, of, like, the MCU quipping and, and everybody being goofy all the time. Mm -hmm. But you also have to understand that you still got people in costumes, you know, and that some sometimes you don't need to go there. You, you don't need to. Or, or what was that other one? Um, Identity Crisis, where uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Sue Dibney gets raped by uh, Dr. Light in the first issue. And they're still in, and he's in costume, and he's on a satellite doing it. It just—it's supposed to be this horrifying moment, but it looks ridiculous because they're superheroes in costumes. And mm -hmm. then, like Batman mm -hmm. shows up, he's like, "What's going on? No!" <laughs> yeah. like, the uh, the one the just, part like, where is... Batman is crying as he's hugging anime girls who are ghosts, <laughs> and he's going, "No, don't disappear! No, don't leave me! Don't, <laughs> don't leave, leave me, anime girls!" I didn't and want to stray. Yeah. 
I don't want to stray too far from literally, but literally. so people who who are interested on Amazon, you can find it there for sure. And I'm pretty sure or I don't know if you, wanna... you can read it for free on Webtoon if you don't okay, want to even better. Yeah. If you want to read it for free on Webtoon, you could do that too. But yeah, we're just trying to that... get the word out. Yeah, you do have that second campaign that you're mm -hmm. running right now. So tell us a little bit more about where we are by the time book two is and what we can expect. I feel like if I talk about the actual content of book two, it's just going to spoil everything. Like people who've been following us since I actually wrote the script back in like 2014 are going to know that the, you know, the second issue is basically kind of a, a joke twist. Um, but then it's not like the twist is like, is it real or not? Because Did you post the script already. Yeah, I, po well, I posted the script a lot of places all over the place. It was on the blog back then. It, I posted it. On the one hand, there's no need to worry about spoiling it because if somebody really wants to read it, uh, I mean, the script is already there and available. It's somewhere. Well, well, here's the thing, though, is that if you want to see it as a comic, though, um, you know, best way is now to back the, th of the uh, campaign. In fact, the campaign... Um, we brought back the uh, the insert your character into the comic uh, uh, the the perk thing, which usually you know for other people it's a, a big disaster, a big potential disaster. Um, for us though, it's really for our our readers and our followers. You know the people who've been familiar with our stuff already uh, just have their opportunity to you know get their character because there's a lot of people who follow us who are also artists and comic creators that kind of thing and so they uh, a lot of them picked up the perk and so half of them are, are taken already but uh the um yeah it's, it's right. a good way to get the it's comic been funded. One day. yeah Only yeah just in the day. first day yeah um uh, but uh as far as the rest of it though it's about you know just supporting the book itself and the book is you know meant to be a continuation on you know the same tone that kind of thing it's about sort of sci-fi adventure comedy slice of life kind of bizarre things and it's the just kind of the thing we wanted to see in a comic it. it's the kind of thing you we wanted to see all along in a comic or a story yeah. but nobody's creative enough to actually do themselves yeah, yeah it's it almost it, it really i know it always comes off like bragging when we say this stuff but nobody has ever made a comic like this before in history not anything yeah, this isn't, like it this isn't bragging it's not ego or vanity. Yeah, the uh, uh, the you know it's a continuation off that that first chapter of the uh, dorky girl who uh, you know is a mech pilot on an alien planet. It's kind of you know very spaceman spiff. It's very influenced by Calvin and Hobbes, but it's got this very different take on it too. Yeah, you know, so if you're gonna say, well, you just said that it's just like something. It's like Calvin and Hobbes. Okay, you got me. you got me there. But yeah, um, it's uh, but again, like Calvin and Hobbes. I mean, how many people have ever successfully managed to replicate that style? Yeah, that I concept? just don't. the th The thing is, I don't want to spoil what happens in the second issue. All I can say is that if you like the first issue, I know you're going to still like the second issue a lot, probably even more, because it's just that next take. It's that next continuation in the story, and then um, and, and it looks like. We, you know, we'll be able to uh, get this done pretty soon because I have a penciler who's just firing off pages, and uh, we will probably be able to do the the final chapter possibly within this year or at least by next year. It's taken a long time for us to really get things, um, you know, off the ground because it's harder when you don't have money, and when you don't have money, you can't make the comic, and when you can't make the comic, you can't get the money. That kind of thing. Of a lot of other factors. Uh, that too. classic uh that was an Alice Cooper song. Yeah. But um yeah, the this uh the new chapter though is uh that's basically what we're going for. We're funding this uh, the, the new adventures of Helen that take place after the end of the first one. And it's gonna the, basically um the one thing I can say about it is that the new adventures are more bizarre in a way. Uh, than anything ever before and it's uh there's a, an element of a rug pull involved with uh just right off the bat from the very beginning in fact so um you know people anyone who uh even remotely liked the first comic is going to be really uh pumped up to see the continuation and then the third chapter actually does like sort of a repeated 
rug pull in a different direction too. So I'm looking forward to getting that done. And if we can, um, you know, have all three done together, we could maybe try and do a collected book of the whole uh, story of literally. And then I even came up with um, like uh, a, a second series afterwards, which would take place in between all of the chapters of one, two, and three of the original literally. Um, and, it's and then on top of that, the, the, the webtoon does have literally. Yeah, figuratively, literally, literally. so to speak, literally. But if you check out the webtoon version of literally, the latest uh, episode is actually a complete, unique, uh, exclusive to the webcomic version, which again, I drew myself, so it's very doodly and simple. But um, it's fun. And in fact, I, I know a lot of people who really liked it and uh, it includes fan art from them. In, at the end of the episode it's better looking than some professionals yeah um but also on top of that i didn't even mention uh villains of the snow sea chapter one and two is another comic that that's, a, I that's put like out. a different that's a different type of comic yeah too. that's a whole different thing a different completely different genre tone all that stuff and then there's i can't help that i'm the world's cutest werewolf which is another comic that is basically webtoon exclusive but if we get enough pages of that i could probably you know uh release a book version of that too and then there's all sorts of other comics that i have written that are ready to go and it's you know all all i've needed is either the artist who can do it or the money to pay the artist or to find an artist and then on top of that my brother already wrote a, a comic on his own too and he's been working with an artist uh, just to make that. And there's a few pages of that already done, and that might be finished by this year. So I, we're, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this on the show that I was like, oh, I, I didn't realize we could actually do this for a living. I never yeah, theoretically. I make, mean, we can make comics. The thing yeah, is, we though, don't, uh, <laughs> I don't think Mark and I quite do it for a living yeah, yet. Yeah, not but, exactly. But yeah, I mean, it's I possible. mean there's a lot of People other elements, it. too, of course, I mean, as far as making I mean, to them. live. Yeah, uh, th that's yeah. the thing is, uh, and we mentioned this, uh, you know, it's like, oh, growing up, what are you going to be, fireman or astronaut Ghost or the or president? Ninja Turtle, it's like, uh, yeah, Transformers. it's like none of these. I don't want to be any of these things. Yeah, I remember telling a teacher I didn't want to be president of the United States. And she's like, yeah. well, why not? And it's like, why would I want you'll, to uh, be president? You'll end up becoming like a, a yeah. pedophile or a rapist yeah. or yeah, something. Gotta, you go yeah, complicit in the pedophile island and stuff and i have to uh like give pardons to rappers who have shot their <laughs> girlfriends or something Why am exactly I doing exactly Why well anyway we yeah. we're pro we've we've gone beyond the hour mark yeah. but um make sure everyone who is listening live or who is tuning in to the replay if you want the link to the current campaign it is in the description and like they said you can actually go to webtoon and read the first volume of literally free if you um, do so choose if you want make to get sure the book to... version it's on amazon the, the printed edition the print on demand. also yeah, print on demand, which is pretty neat I, yeah I, I know that Mark has experimented with it, and he thinks the quality is really good for the for Amazon's print. Yeah, it's surprisingly the good the, for the. Well, whole I mean, system. the thing is, there are people out there who basically demand that they only read a comic if it's in print, and if they're going to do that, here it is. We don't have to put up any more money. And the price actually that. dropped. Uh, that's one thing okay. I noticed okay. is that they they charge le They've been charging less since we started this. Is uh, it's actually cheaper the print on demand system? They they just straight up lowered the price overall. Yeah. For, at least for our books, especially well, the, for literally lowest, number one. The lowest price is still going to be digital. Okay. Yeah. Well, exactly. And especially like to, also the blurb. Yeah. Also, we got some uh, good blurbs for uh, literally also. Yeah, that's like uh, I think a lot of people don't even know or realize it's like one of Tim and Mark's favorite comics. <laughs> I don't to point out. I've seen one of those quotes. I'm like, I don't know if I literally said that, but I might have. I mean, that I say. Well, I things. got all of this. That's the, the you pulled it from thing. YouTube, didn't you? Yeah, from somebody was screen. watching the old YouTube videos of us together from like 2018, and they're like, they actually linked me to timestamps <laughs> of you talking about uh, literally <laughs> and and just the other stuff in our channel and that kind of our old that's dedication right there, going that far back well I'm, I'm glad if we if our endorsement can help in any way shape or form i'm more mm -hmm. than happy to um provide that but anyway guys 
who are listening or who are tuning into the replay, make sure to check them out. They have their own channel that you can check out as well. They have a Patreon too that you can find through the link as well there. So there's a lot of ways that you can um, see the content that they put out. But anyway, uh, I have a business meeting at this time for a convention that we're doing. They actually, this guy's blowing up my phone saying that they need more art to, for us to use for this thing. So I need to go give them a call. But anyway, um, check out those comic strips that we're talking about. Check out the floor. Check out literally. Check out the campaign for literally number two. And we will talk to you guys very soon. Have a good week. Have a good day. Have a good night. God bless y'all. Bye. Yeah.